Okay, now I just want to let you know that our three speakers will be speaking and then we will be entertaining questions at the end. So as we go forward, make sure that you write down your questions on your phone, key them in, be ready, because we're gonna go around with a microphone and we really wanna know what questions you have. Also, I noticed that there are a few people who don't have seats, just so that you know, if you walk around this, the back and up around here, there are seats over on this side. So we don't want you to get tired feet. All right, so thank you very much, Dr. Wolfendale. Our next speaker is Amy Seifert. Amy Seifert is the director of Aspire, which is an office with the dual missions of assisting students applying for nationally competitive scholarships and fellowships and assisting students who are applying for graduate or professional school. A Morgantown native, Amy is a graduate of Carnegie Mellon University, a 2000 Truman Scholar, and a cum laude graduate of Harvard Law School. Prior to coming to West Virginia University, Amy served as a law clerk to a federal judge in Manhattan and also worked as an attorney there for many years. Amy teaches several courses to both undergraduate and law students, including philosophy of law and appellate advocacy. So please welcome Amy Seifert. Susan, I will forgive you for saying I practiced law for many years because we all know that it must have been like 12 minutes I was there, right? Because we're so young. That's what we'll keep telling ourselves. I'm really excited to be here. I'm really honored to be speaking alongside Dr. Wolfendale and Ms. Fuller. I just told Dr. Wolfendale I wasn't nervous until she gave a great speech and now I have to, to follow that, so that's tough. But I'm also really excited to be here because Brian Stevenson spoke to my 1L class of law school, my first year of law school. And I can still remember to this day where I was sitting in the room. I can remember what he said about uh, why he does the work he does and how none of us are only the worst thing we've ever done. You may have lied, but you're not just a liar. You may have stolen, but you're not just a thief. And he really inspired me and inspired a lot of the work that I did after leaving law school and going on. So it's really exciting for me and, and a special honor to be discussing his work in part tonight. So what I want to talk with you about today is what is the point of criminal punishment? And there are a lot of different ways we can, we can look at this. And certainly as, as a lawyer, I'm going to want to go to the text and as someone who spent time clerking for a federal judge and so being involved in sentencing and other things, we'll be looking at the federal sentencing guidelines. But in the end, I think you'll see that the question is not only what is the point of criminal punishment, but also who is it supposed to benefit? And Dr. Wolfendale touched on that and I'll, I'll speak a bit more about it. So the philosophers in the room will know that on your first day of philosophy of law, they will often tell you that there are these two camps and we can all quibble later about just how competing there are, they are. But there are these two camps that try to answer the question, what should be the point of criminal punishment? And the first is retributivists. I've been practicing that one most of the day. And the second is consequentialists. And this is a big deal in the field of philosophy, sort of who is right about this and, and who should uh, be correct. Retributiv retributivists see punishment as being in an, having an intrinsic value, punishment for punishment's sake. They believe that the act or the offense itself justifies the imposition of punishment. And in that sense, it also helps to elucidate or to reinforce our own moral edicts or our own moral codes. Consequentialists really think of what, what uh, the greater good punishment can serve or what is the point that it is supposed to be having. They, they don't believe in punishment for punishment's sake, but rather, as the name suggests, they want to look at what the outcomes are that punishment can produce or what the consequences are that punishment can produce. So in that sense, consequentialism is, is forward facing and looks ahead, whereas retributivism is backward facing and looks back at trying to restore the status quo. So because people have been arguing about this since the beginning of philosophy, there was a lot of excitement when in the late 80s, the uh, Federal Sentencing Commission was putting together the Federal Sentencing Guidelines and they were going to include an entire section on what should be the point of punishment because people were like, great, you know, team retributivism and team consequentialism could have finally an answer to their question. 
Um, sadly, it didn't quite work out that way. The federal sentencing guidelines really sort of split the baby. They decided that both were important. They weren't going to try to pick one over the other. It, this upset people so much that one of the law professors who was on the Sentencing Commission actually quit in protest, and he said, and I quote, the resulting guidelines are haphazard and internally inconsistent. And if a lawyer is telling you something is haphazard and internally inconsistent, you know you're in some trouble. So what we will do is we will look at the federal sentencing guidelines themselves, and they really codify four different goals for punishment, okay? So they, the statute talks about retribution, deterrence, protection of the public, and rehabilitation. It is my argument to you tonight that the death penalty really can only serve one of these goals and that in fact much of our, our um, energy and our money in the federal prison system is spent on only the first of these goals. But we'll talk about each one. And it's interesting by the way to track the federal sentencing guidelines, not only because they apply to all of the states and so they're interesting in that sense, but also because the federal sentencing guidelines allow federal judges to impose the death sentence even in states that don't have the death sentence. So for example, in the state of Massachusetts where there is no death sentence, the Boston Marathon bomber was nonetheless able to be sentenced to death in that case because it was the, the charges that were brought were federal charges. And so it, it's really interesting because even in populations where the citizens have voted or have decided overwhelmingly that they do not want the death penalty in their jurisdiction, the federal guidelines can nonetheless allow for that to happen. I will say though that of the 80 federal defendants who've been sentenced to death since 1988, only three of them have actually been executed and that includes uh, Timothy McVeigh, the Oklahoma City bomber. So I, I, the Boston Marathon bomber probably has years and years of appeals in front of his case. Let's <laughs> talk first about retribution because I really think this is the goal that is most clearly served by the death penalty and that is also probably most clearly served by lengthy prison sentences because <laughs> Mr. Stevenson's book of course doesn't only talk about the death penalty, it also talks about the injustice of sentencing minors to essentially die in prison sentences I think is the word he uses and other really lengthy sentences. So under the retributive theory, you know, the wrongdoing of the, the punisher should be punished in um, correspondence with the moral reprehensibility of the crime or the magnitude of the breach of the public harm or something like this. And it really does seem to me that this is the strongest and in so many ways the only uh, justification we can have for using the death penalty. So I actually spend the least amount of time on this one. And I'd like to look at deterrence because a lot of people say, okay, so the death penalty, it's, it's something that, as Dr. Wolfendale put out there, we feel really squeamish about and that is uncomfortable and yet it's this important thing because this is going to allow us to deter people. So there's both specific deterrence and general deterrence and specific deterrence is, hey, you, the person who did this thing, you are now deterred from doing it again. General deterrence is, hey, greater public, this thing that happened is a bad thing and we want you all to know it's a bad thing and that it's punishable so that you're deterred. Obviously, I guess, with spe the, the death penalty, specific deterrence is going to be satisfied because someone who is no longer living can no longer commit crimes. But there haven't really actually been any studies that show that life uh, imprisonment sentences or even really lengthy imprisonment sentences don't provide an equal amount of specific deterrence. It's pretty hard for people to escape from federal supermax prisons if they're there for life. So it's, I don't know that the specific deterrence argument really carries the day. And interestingly, the general deterrence argument isn't really borne out for the death penalty either. Um, to take, uh, studies have shown that states that have the death penalty as opposed to states that don't, don't necessarily have lower crime rates. In fact, they tend to have higher crime rates. And you can say, well, but they have the death penalty because they have more crime, but it doesn't really work like that. To use the case study of New York, for a period in the late 90s and the early 2000s, New York State had a death penalty again after having not had it for a while. The, the then Governor Pataki reinstated it for about seven years. So before the death penalty was reinstated in New York State, crime, violent crime rates had been falling, including the murder rate, which by the way has been a national trend since the 90s. So those violent crime rates were falling and then he reinstated the death penalty. No one was actually executed, but he reinstated the death penalty 
and the violent crime rates continued to fall. And then in 2004, the highest state court in New York overturned it and said, no, you can't have the death penalty anymore, and crime rates continued to fall, and they continue to fall since then. So it's, th there aren't a lot of good studies that are able to show that the death penalty in any way actually deters the types of crimes that we're doing, we're doing that for. So then, we can talk about protection of the public. And again, I think that this argument is wrapped up with this idea of deterrence, because if it's not deterring people, then is it actually protecting people? And again, the idea that, well, we're going to protect someone from this hardened criminal who is beyond hope, beyond rehabilitation. It's hard to see how uh, lifetime uh, imprisonment sentences wouldn't serve that same uh, goal. It's also really interesting to think about how expensive the death penalty is, and I think that if we're trying to talk about protecting the public, we have to think like economists and think, well, where would that money go if we weren't using it on the death penalty? And people go, well, wait, how is it expensive to have the death penalty? Isn't it way more expensive to have people in prison? No, actually, um, in the state of California, the um, California Commission on the Fair Administration of Justice came out with a report a couple of years ago and they said that the additional cost of confining an inmate to death row as compared to maximum security prisons where those sentenced to life without possibility of parole ordinarily serve their sentences is 90,000 per year per inmate. And that's the additional cost. So with California's current death row population, that accounts for about $63 million annually. And that's beyond just thinking about, uh, the lawyers in the room know that if you are sentenced to death, you are guaranteed counsel for many, many layers of appeals that are going to happen. And oftentimes that is paid for, I'd say almost all of the time, that is paid for either by the public, through taxpayer dollars, or it is done through pro bono work like this. So it's hard to argue that this is really protecting the public because there's no real deterrent value that's been established. It's very expensive, it's costing money, it's doing other things there. So then we get to rehabilitation, and I think this is the one where it's most obviously not being served by the death penalty, because of course someone who is no longer living is not being rehabilitated at all. And I also think that we have to remember that even for you know life imprisonment sentences or other lengthy sentences which the book addresses, it's hard to really talk about how rehabilitation is a goal of our prison system given that the first things that are cut whenever there are cuts to the, the prison uh, budgets is usually rehabilitative purposes or, or services for inmates. So there have been massive cuts to those types of programs which we know actually reduce recidivism and we know uh, help people who are leaving prison get re um, adequated and adjusted to society. So I don't think that there's really much of an argument at all that the death penalty is serving any kind of rehabilitative purpose. And under our current system with uh, totally woefully underfunded rehabilitative programs within the, the prisons, it's hard to know how really any sentence at this point is serving that purpose. So finally, I think the question is not just what purposes should uh, punishment serve, but also who should it serve. And I think one thing we wanna think about is really what the death penalty does uh, to our society and whether or not the, the very existence of it does something like degrade our society or make us more difficult. And Dr. Wolfendale did an excellent job of talking about some of those points. I would also note it, that this question of who it's supposed to serve is really interesting because in the federal system and in many systems, victims are allowed to give victim impact statements. And one question that we often think about is, well, do we, how much weight should we put in what the victim of a crime or the family members of a deceased victim of a crime want? Uh, most of the victims um, and the family members of the deceased victims of the Boston Marathon bombing actually asked the court not to impose the death penalty. And you know how much weight we give to those considerations and, and who matters and who gets to speak in court are other things that are, are very interesting too. So I think that if we are looking at what is the point of punishment, we have these four stated goals that the federal sentencing guidelines give us, but it's hard to see how any of them other than retribution are being served by our current system. And I also think that when we look at who should punishment be benefiting, right now it's hard to see that it's, it's benefiting anyone given that the goals are largely not being met. Thank you.